Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're family. We can do better than that. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am John Gase, Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion in the School of Engineering and Applied Science. I'm pleased to welcome you to this evening's event, uh, a conversation with Dr. Francis Collins of the National Institutes of Health. This is part of the Excellence Through Diversity Distinguished Learning Series, and it is, in fact, our distinguished lecture. When we thought about who to invite uh, for this evening, we wanted a scientist, and we wanted a scientist with soul, right? Because this is diversity. And diversity is about more than race and gender and sexual orientation and all of our wonderful differences and distinctions. It is also about the mind and the soul and the spirit and community. Dr. Collins is renowned for science, but he's also renowned for his consciousness. And tonight will be a reflection of just that. Among his many quotes, he said, I believe God indeed in giving us intelligence to give us the opportunity to investigate and appreciate the wonders of his creation. He is not threatened by our scientific adventures. Faith is reason plus revelation, and the revelation part requires one to think with the spirit as well as with the mind. You have to hear the music, not just read the notes. Tonight, we're going to hear the music. As a tribute to Dr. Collins, uh, I am pleased to present a phenomenal, phenomenal songstress uh, who has performed all over the world. Candace Potts, a native of Baltimore, Maryland, and a proud graduate of Morgan State University. She has performed at the Kennedy Center and Carnegie Hall with numerous other performances in the United States, China, Russia, South America, Brazil, Italy, and Jamaica. She is accompanied by the wonderful, if I can remember his name, Marcus Smith. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Candace Potts and Marcus Smith. Good evening, everyone. It's an honor to be here, and I'm so excited. And I'm um, just going to sing a couple songs for you, and I hope you enjoy. Sunday, that's the day. 
Still away 
precious Lord, take my, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am we I am I am Take my hand to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, and lead. Oh, lead me.
precious Lord, and lead me Because the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything that I need. He, he lets me rest in the meadow's grass, and he leads me beside the quiet streams, and he restores my present health. Yes, he does. And he helps me to do it on his head the most. That's why I'm safe. That's why I'm safe. That's why I'm safe. him the most. That's why I'm safe. That's why I'm safe. That's why I'm Safety. 
Now you have a sense of how we do what we do. And I think we're now ready to talk about science. It is my great privilege to present Dr. Richard P. Shannon, the Executive Vice President for Health Affairs at UVA, to present our speaker, Dr. Shannon. Thank you, John. Good evening. Welcome to the Excellence in Diversity Distinguished Lectureship Series as UVA gives voice to our inextricable interdependence as human beings. It's my pleasure to introduce our very special guest tonight, Dr. Francis Collins. Dr. Collins is now in his ninth year as the director of the National Institutes of Health, the heart of the nation's biomedical research enterprise, and I dare say that of the world. Dr. Collins first joined the NIH in 1993 when, he's when he was appointed by my friend and colleague, Dr. Bernadine Healy, to succeed Dr. James Watson as director of the National Center for the Human Genome Research. In 1997, he embarked on just a small little project known as the Human Genome Project, culminating just three years later in a draft map of the entire human genome. It was truly a moonshot for all of biomedical research. Dr. Collins wrote, it is humbling for me and awe-inspiring to realize that we have caught the first glimpse of our own instruction book, previously known only to God. Raised on a farm in Stanton, he received his Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry here at UVA in 1970, and went on to get his doctoral degree in chemistry at Yale in 1974. He went on to do his medical training and his medical residency and chief residency in internal medicine at the University of North Carolina, and then completed a fellowship in human genetics back at Yale. Dr. Collins is truly a man for all seasons. 
In his New York Times bestseller, The Language of God, he speaks of theistic evolution, providing a difficult reconciliation between the theory of evolution and creationism, shedding light on a divisive debate in our culture and demonstrating that common ground can be found between seemingly irreconcilable positions. He is also an extraordinary musician and guitarist. Witness his virtuoso performance with the National Symphony and the celebrated soprano Renee Fleming at the Kennedy Center. Nothing without purpose, this effort has gone on to launch an initiative called Sound Health, Music and the Mind, investigating the scientific basis by which music can improve and our brain function. And that if this was not all enough, beyond the Human Genome Project, his tenure at the NIH, as the NIH director has been transformative for the American bioresearch enterprise. Among his many accomplishments and creations is the National Center for Advancing Translational Science, the Clinical and Translational Science Awards, and importantly, the launch of the Precision Medicine Initiative. He is an eloquent and effective spokesperson for the U.S. research agenda in the halls of our government and has garnered respect across the aisle. And last, but by no means least, Dr. Collins has renewed the NIH's longstanding commitment to the storied NIH Clinical Center, the world's largest hospital dedicated to research. With a refreshing reorganization that now positions this, tre this national treasure for its next great discovery, the NIH Clinical Center, referred to as the, NI as the National Institutes of Hope, and its extraordinary staff is the home to more than 1,600 clinical research trials, many of which focus on rare diseases without advocates. The Clinical Center has given rise to medical milestones too numerous to count, but recently chronicled beautifully in the Discovery Channel documentary, First in Human. It is truly the beacon of hope that is agnostic as to whether or not a human being can pay. And it is with great pride that I serve with Dr. Collins and his many colleagues on the NIH Clinical Center's Hospital Board of Directors, from which I have personally given, been able to witness miracles that occur there with regularity. So in summary, we are in for an extraordinary treat tonight. We have just started the evening with just an un, a, a beautiful, beautiful series of song. And Candace, thank you so much. But now the main attraction. Uh, the University of Virginia could not be more proud to welcome back truly one of its most distinguished alumni, an extraordinary physician scientist, and a great humanitarian. Please welcome me, please join me in welcoming Dr. Francis Collins. Thank you, Dr. Shannon, for an overly, wonderfully positive introduction. I don't know how I'm going to live up to this, but thank you also for your service on that hospital board that you mentioned. Dr. Shannon has been a source of wonderful, wise advice for me and the others at the NIH Clinical Center since we twisted his arm uh, to come and join this enterprise, and that is much appreciated. And sitting here for the first half hour and listening to Candace's singing, I really thought that perhaps we should just call off my remarks and let her keep going because it's uh, pretty hard to do anything after that except want to hear more uh, of that remarkable voice, that remarkable passion, those three octaves of range. I think I heard every one of those notes in that three octave range. Candace, you are amazing. Watch out, world. And I appreciate very much the sentiment that was expressed by Dr. Fitzgerald about the intention of this evening that we really are here to talk about diversity in lots of different ways. And I want to take that with great seriousness, but to bring to you a message from the National Institutes of Health about some of the ways in which we are trying to play our part in this incredibly important topic. And my congratulations to this university for having the foresight to have a focus on this issue even before the events of August, which caused the world to turn their eyes to Charlottesville, and which I know must be a source of continuing struggle and debate and heartache for the faculty, the students, and the townspeople of this wonderful town.
but you're out in front of it. You were even before those occasions uh, caused so much consternation and distress. And I have the greatest confidence that this university, this academic village that stands for light and truth and love uh, will make the most of a terrible situation and educate all of us about how we can think in ways that are generous, that are inclusive, that recognize the absolute complete worth of every human being. And I am delighted to be able to be here to contribute in a small way to what you are doing. And I am delighted to be here again as someone who spent four wonderful years as an undergraduate at the University of Virginia. I told a couple of people when I walked in this hall, I immediately could identify the seat right over there where I came my first month as a freshman, 1966. Uh, I was 16 years old. I came here a little younger than most of my classmates. And I was a chemistry major, so I was kind of a geek and a nerd over there in the science buildings. But I loved to come to Old Cabell Hall to hear musical presentations. And that first time I came here and heard on this stage a string quartet playing music live that I'd never heard played live. I'd heard the recordings and I was transported that it was possible for such a thing to happen. And I knew I was in the right place. And I still know that that was the right choice for me. And as a kid from Stanton coming just over the mountain uh, to this university, as did two of my three brothers, uh, was a connection that my family benefited from and benefits from today. So thank you for inviting me back. Let me see what I can share with you then, and I hope we'll have time for some questions at the end to see what's on your mind, because there's so much about this topic that might find its way into a presentation, and I'm only going to be able to scratch a few surfaces. First, let me just remind you what NIH is all about, although most of you know we are the steward of medical and behavioral research for the United States. Our mission is both pursuit of fundamental knowledge, that's basic science, but also the application of that knowledge. Everywhere from people working in labs on projects that don't seem to have any connection to human health but are understanding the mysteries of life, to that clinical center, that research hospital, the largest in the world, all of that folded together. And of course, NIH doesn't spend all of our money in Bethesda, although some people think we do. It goes out in grants and contracts to those most amazing scientists all over the country and some outside the country that are doing the work of biomedical research in places like the University of Virginia. Here you can see in a map sort of what the intensity is of funding of various states, and it's very much a reflection of where our finest universities are, including here. Uh, Virginia, just to give you the tally, uh, it received $318 million last year in NIH grants, and you can see UVA did pretty darn well there, uh, having a very significant chunk of that total, and I'm sure those who are sitting here in the front rows who are responsible for <laughs> university success want to see that number go up, but, you know, it's a peer review system, see what you can do. So what to say about diversity? I'm going to talk about three topics, and they may seem a little disconnected, but I think they are connected. First of all, what do we know about human ancestry, and how does that information, much of it derived from genomics, contribute to our understanding of the relatedness of people across this world? And how can that be a useful contribution to this always controversial question about whether there are people who are different or whether we're really all the same? I'm going to advocate, uh, based on data, uh, that we are all the same. It helps, of course, that we have the digital record of our history. You can think of the human genome, those three billion letters written in a strange language that has only four letters in its alphabet, as a book of history. Each of us has a genome. We can now sequence yours for about $1,000 because it's gotten that cheap, although the first one Back in 2003, when we completed it, we added it up. That cost about $400 million. So it's, it's come down quite a bit. <laughs> but that makes it possible to really begin to look across the world and say, OK, how, how does this digital information tell us about our relatedness? And it's actually quite impressive and quite powerful. Not only did we have the Human Genome Project, we had something that started right after it that I also had the privilege of leading called the HapMap Project, which is a funny name and I won't try to explain a haplotype to you, but basically this was a way of trying to understand that 0.1% of the genome where we differ. 
99.9% were the same, 0.1% is a pretty small number, but it's interesting, and it's in that variable part that we might learn something about our inheritance as well as about our risks for particular illnesses. So HapMap basically went about collecting DNA samples, not just from the usual subjects who were involved in, in research, which tended to be people in the US or in Europe, and oftentimes those were people of European extraction, but also samples, as you can see here, from multiple other uh, origins. And we did this in a very careful way, making sure that the individuals who donated DNA samples understood what was happening and went through a full consent process. Here you see a picture of a chief uh, in Ibadan, Nigeria, carrying his papers with him to the meeting uh, to decide whether he wants to participate or not. Those samples, which then were available for study by lots of groups, uh, taught us a lot about the relatedness of individuals across the world. But this was only a sample of variation. It got even more detailed as sequencing got cheaper and cheaper, and we could begin to not just sample the DNA of a few thousand people, we could actually get the entire sequence and this was the Thousand Genomes Project, and again, an effort made here very explicitly to obtain DNA samples from people across the world. On top of that, multiple other projects that have been added to the effort at NIH, all of these being efforts that are funded in a way that makes sure all the data gets placed immediately in the public domain so that everybody can learn from it and that also are teaching us a lot, just, not just about the one-dimensional DNA sequence, but about how it actually works, how it functions. And basically what we have learned fits this model extremely well. That we are in fact all part of one family, that the original founders of our species were black Africans, uh, somewhere a bit of a debate about East versus South Africa, but certainly African. There was a migration out of Africa roughly 50 or 60,000 years ago into the Middle East. And from there, uh, subsequent migrations across the world, as you see in the map, uh, carrying with it founders who had their own particular DNA variations that you can then think of as providing a footprint or a fingerprint of where we were and how we got here. And all of this information entirely consistently now based upon our understanding of DNA and fits quite well also with other bits of information we have as for instance from ancient samples of humans who we have now been able to determine DNA sequence from. There are some interesting twists here. It does seem that there was actually some coexistence of Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, uh, probably in the Middle East, about 35 to 40,000 years ago, and there was some interbreeding. And so that those of us who descend from that particular part of the world, which is most people uh, in Europe, do in fact have about three or four percent of their DNA sequence that can be traced back to the Neanderthal source. Um, that's not necessarily something people expected, and there's a lot of interesting you know, things we can talk about there in terms of what effect that had, if any, on our biology. But the main point here is that if anyone tries to tell you that somehow there are groups on this planet that are different in a fundamental way in terms of their origins from all the rest of us, you can tell them that that's simply not the case. Let no one think that they will find evidence from genomic science to support a prejudiced view of humanity. You will not find it there. Now, what does this mean when it comes to our understanding of health disparities, a major source of research interest and responsibility for those of us at NIH? We want to understand why it is that some groups have higher incidences or lower incidences of particular conditions, and what could we do about it uh, to try to improve the circumstances for people whose health is not as good as we think it should be, and we need to understand what that's about. There's been an endless debate, of course, about whether those are environmental influences or health behaviors or genetics, and in most instances, we are still sorting that out. But maybe it's useful to kind of think about a diagram, one that I actually put together now 13 years ago, but I think it's actually still pretty much on track for what we know. People have a self-identified race or ethnicity. People have, from their experiences, from their family, they think of themselves in a particular way. Most of us, maybe not all. But now how does that actually connect with your genetic uh, ancestry? Well, in an indirect way, probably, but not a completely perfect way. The question is, how does that connect with your risk of health or disease? I'm going to submit that, in fact, 
most of that effect is going to be based on your environmental exposures, and that includes education, access to health care, culture, socioeconomic status, and stress. Those are probably the main factors that play out in terms of whether particular groups are experiencing a health disparity. Yes, ancestral geographic origins are in there, and that in turn is connected to some degree of genomic variation, and in some instances that may play out in a different propensity for a particular disease risk variant to appear in your genome. But frankly, I think for the most part, that tends to be a rather modest effect. If we're talking about common illnesses like heart disease, diabetes, uh, hypertension, and so on. So if we're interested in understanding health disparities, take it from me, the genetics guy, don't pay so much attention to genetics to the exclusion of the environment. Look at the environment, and maybe you can figure out how between the interactions you could make sense out of this. So that's just a bit of a spin about human ancestry and how that plays out. And again, my main point here is that when we look at the diversity of the world, we should think of it as a wonderful opportunity uh, to understand all of the differences that have occurred, some of them actually selected for. The fact that I have white skin is probably because when my black ancestors moved north, if they continued to have such darkly pigmented skin, there would be a problem with vitamin D, and the women, therefore, would be likely to have difficulty in childbirth because of a form of rickets. Similarly, if I lived in black African area right now, I would end up with melanomas probably within uh, my age 15 or 20 if I didn't have access to sunscreen. So you can see the effect of environment on some of our diversity, and it makes perfect sense, and it's actually quite beautiful and satisfying to contemplate. But somehow, we humans, with our great propensity uh, to try to identify otherness that makes somebody different than us, have attached a great deal of significance to those features, which those features don't really deserve. Okay, let me go to the next topic. If diversity is important, and it is, do we in this country, particularly amongst NIH grantees, do we have a diverse workforce? Now, why do I say it's important? This is not just because it's a nice thing to do. There is credible science in many different fields, and we're supporting additional areas right now in biomedical research to say that diverse teams are more productive than teams that are all the same. You've probably seen some of that data in business. It's certainly true in science. So if we're interested, and I am as the director, in trying to make sure that our resources are producing the maximum amount of scientific productivity, it is not helping us if we have a workforce that's rather monochromatic. And in fact, that is a problem. And it's a problem that we've had for decades, and it's a problem that we are now determined to take a very aggressive path forward on to see if we can actually do something and then hold ourselves accountable. So I want to tell you about that. It's part of our strategic plan. This, by the way, if you want to see sort of the thinking at NIH about how we set priorities across science, uh, across our workforce training, uh, across our stewardship of resources, uh, this particular plan, which is not available in hard copy because we don't think that's all that helpful anymore. It's up on the web. Uh, if you just Google NIH-wide strategic plan and you can read about it, it's only a fairly brief document, but it has some good stuff in there about stewardship and diversity. First, let's talk about women. We have done a lot better in uh, the United States in the past few decades in terms of women faculty in science at the earlier stages. We have not done so well in terms of coming up with ways to make it possible for women to advance uh, into senior positions. You can see this in the diagram here. This shows medical school applicants and graduates pretty close between men and women. Many medical schools are now graduating slightly more women than men. Uh, but in the faculty ranks, while at an assistant professor level, the differences are not so great. Look at associate and then look at full professor. Now, some may say, well, that's just a cohort effect. We have to wait for that new uh, dose uh, of women who are coming through to get to the point in their careers where they will also be made full professors. That will not explain this. Uh, we are way behind where we should be on that basis. So clearly, there are factors in the academic institutions that are discouraging to women from rising to the highest ranks as professors, as deans, as chairs, and so on. 
and there's been a lot of discussion about that, and I'm sure there's a lot of discussion here at the University of Virginia because I know this is an issue this institution cares deeply about, but let's all admit we have not solved it yet, and this is a really critical issue for our future. At the current rate of improvement, while you could say it's getting a little bit better all the time, and it is, uh, but it'll take 48 years nationwide before we have gender parity as full professors. That's a little too long, don't you think? So what are we doing about encouraging women in science? Uh, we at the NIH have paid a lot of attention to this. Uh, there's a National Academies report I think many of you are familiar with from 10 years ago. We've had a working group on women in biomedical careers, which I co-chair, and which has not only hosted workshops, but actually figured out ways to fund research to identify the factors that are involved here, as well as interventions to change them. And there is a whole website about that, womeninscience.nih.gov, if you want to read more about what that group has been up to and what some of their conclusions are, including results of an entire uh, FOA that was put out on this issue, which had some interesting findings and some uh, potential actionable results. But now let me go on to the other kind of diversity, uh, that is, of ethnicity, ancestral background. And again, I'm sorry to say, we at NIH have a long way to go. Uh, if you look at uh, this uh, pie chart here uh, by race, uh, you will notice uh, that white is the vast majority. The second most common, Asian. Uh, by the way, maybe you were hoping that this purple slice uh, would be uh, a, a defined group. This is unknown, so we don't know uh, who those are. So the rest of the diversity in our workforce, uh, you can see, is 1.3% uh, black or African American. 0.9% uh, uh, for uh, multi-race and, if I've got it right, 0.1%. Uh, um, well, I'm, you can probably see it better than I can on the small screen. We're not doing very well here. That's <laughs> <laughs> and we're also not doing well uh, with the Latino uh, uh, parts of our population. So I've got to tell you, we at NIH have been trying to work on this for decades, and it is hard to see that we've made much of an impact. So this is certainly an issue that needs uh, a lot of attention. And back in 2011, six years ago, not long after I became NIH director, uh, Larry Tabak, uh, who is the very dedicated principal deputy director and somebody who is deeply committed to diversity, and I wrote this piece about what we really think we need to do to take this seriously, and appointed uh, a working group of my advisory committee uh, to look at the circumstance and make some very substantive recommendations, even though they might cost us a lot of money. And they did make recommendations, and they cost a lot of money, and I want to tell you about them. So they, for once, uh, they did say, we have a serious problem with recruiting and retaining people from traditionally underrepresented groups. We don't look like a welcoming workforce. Uh, if you don't see somebody around you who's had a similar experience, it's a lot harder to figure out how you belong. If you don't have a natural mentor network the way many people in the majority population do, it is much harder to get over those rough spots in the training which are going to come up, and that's where we lose a lot of people from underrepresented groups. So I created an office for scientific workforce diversity across all of NIH. We had not had that before, and I recruited Hannah Valentine, a distinguished cardiologist from Stanford, uh, to come and lead this effort. And Hannah arrived uh, three and a half years ago and has been an absolute dynamo in pushing all of us uh, to come up with creative solutions and hold ourselves accountable uh, for this uh, situation. If you want to read more about some of the things that she and I are thinking about, there is an article in PNAS a couple of years ago talking about how we are trying to address the science of diversity. Again, we're trying to tackle this not as a feel-good thing, but what is the scientific basis that we could put our efforts upon and have a chance that they're going to work, and how are we going to collect the evidence uh, to determine whether a particular program is successful or not. And this article talks about those things. So new programs that we've introduced. First of all, it was clear to us that we, there are a lot of people from underrepresented groups who are interested in science, and particularly in life science, in the course of their K through 12 education. And they get to college, and many of them are still interested, but many of the underrepresented groups, often from lower socioeconomic status uh, families, do not end up in a place where there's a lot of research resources around them in their particular institutions. And without a real serious exposure 
uh, to research that you are doing yourself at the bench or in some other environment, it's very hard for people to see themselves going forward as a scientist. That's just simply the case. When I talk to scientists today who are active and making great strides and discoveries and say, when did you know you wanted to be a scientist? Invariably, it's, well, I got to do this experiment and I learned something for myself. It wasn't reading about it in a book or hearing about it in a lecture. So we have to figure out how to give all that talent out there that doesn't happen to have those resources immediately around them a chance to do that. So that's the BUILD program, Building Infrastructure Leading to Diversity. Basically, we have funded a whole series of institutions where there are a lot of those particular talented students. Those institutions often are the ones that have many students on Pell Grants. But we then make for those students the opportunity to get real research experience in a summer in a research intensive university and even to work for a year or two after college before going on to graduate school. In addition, we've set up a mentoring network because that was clearly a place where things fall apart for those from underrepresented groups. They don't have those natural mentors. And I can certainly tell you the number of times I almost quit science, having a mentor who is there to kind of commiserate and encourage and help you think through what the next option might be when everything fell apart, that was critical. Now we have a national network that actually puts together mentors and mentees. Uh, and we have a coordinating center that is actually watching over all of this to be sure that we're getting where we need to go and not waiting 10 years to find out. So all of this is together, this BUILD program, 10 sites, 2,400 students already together. We are spending $50 million a year on this effort, which is the largest investment in diversity training in a long time. Uh, it involves Hispanic serving institutions, the HBCUs, public universities, state colleges. Uh, we have a number of interventions that are being introduced as part of the program. The activities of the mentoring network now includes 1,456 mentors who are making themselves available, not necessarily to people down the hall, but maybe somebody across the country if that's the right match, that we've never had that opportunity to do that. Now it's an experiment. Do I know if it's working yet? Not quite. But I think in another year or two, we will begin to see what happens with these students. Do we have a better chance of retaining them with their dreams of going into science than has traditionally been the case? But I got to say, all of this only works in terms of diversity training if we have the institutional support to make that possible. And I think here at UVA, from what I know, that's a very high priority. And I'm glad to see that and certainly would encourage you in every way uh, to make sure that all of these kinds of resources and institutional supports are there. And again, when it comes to recruiting, uh, this is a common uh, refrain of Hannah Valentine as we look at our faculty recruits for our intramural program. It's great to have your search committee come up with diversity candidates, but it doesn't amount to much if you don't hire them. <laughs> so we have to really pay attention to what are those search committees doing? Is there still some kind of unconscious bias uh, to bringing on board talented folks who don't happen to look like the traditional candidates? We put together what I think might be useful, and I'll also give a little advertisement for it here, a scientific workforce diversity interactive toolkit uh, that if you're interested in looking at both students, postdocs, and faculty, uh, provides you with some encouraging kinds of tools that might be useful for any institution that considers this to be a priority, and I know you all do. And again, I think this commitment uh, to diversity has to be associated with transparency, accountability, making sure that we are in fact holding ourselves completely responsible for not just figuring out what we want to do, but doing it and then feeding that back. There has to be this feedback loop. Now here's an awkward and difficult question for us at NIH that I want to briefly mention which is, okay, so you have managed to recruit some individuals from underrepresented groups into your workforce, and they are now somewhere in the United States applying to the NIH for a grant. What is their success rate? They are otherwise well matched in terms of their training, in terms of their publications. Do African Americans, for instance, when they send in their R01, which is that usual principal investigator driven grant, uh, do they encounter the same likelihood of getting funded as somebody who is from the majority population? This question was asked by Donna Ginther at our request. This is a study we commissioned. The senior author, Raynard Kington, was the acting director of NIH at the time. And what was uncovered 
was apparently not a surprise uh, to people from diverse groups because they were already aware of it, but it sure was a surprise to a lot of the rest of the folks. And yes, the answer was there's a difference, that that likelihood of getting funded is about 10 percentage points lower for somebody who's African American compared to the majority population, even if everything else seems to be well matched. So what is going on here? This is a wake-up call, a very significant one. We've studied this intensively, and there's a couple publications already out and more that are coming, but there are certainly factors here that are beginning to emerge that are interesting, but they don't completely settle the answer to this. Uh, possible factors, it turns out that African American principal investigators have a lower rate of submission of grants, and of course you're not going to get funded unless you submit, and much of that seems to be that those applicants seem to carry a heavier load of other things. Uh, course teaching, committees, because, oh, we need a diverse representation on this committee. So the burden that falls on their shoulders in academic institutions is substantially higher, and that takes a toll in terms of how many grant applications they can put together. But it is true that of the applications that are submitted to NIH, about half of them don't get discussed. They get a quick re quicker review and then are considered unlikely to get funded, and the other half do get an intense discussion by peer review. It's clear there's a lower rate of the applications being discussed and a lower rate of funding of the ones that do get discussed and scored. So the data is quite clear. There's a difference here. There's another interesting point, which is there's a lower rate of resubmission. Uh, that is, an African-American applicant who does not get funded in the first try is less likely to revise and resubmit uh, than a majority applicant. And that's a critical issue because resubmissions have a much higher success rate. Once you've looked at the reviewer's comments and you've rewritten things, you're more likely to get funded. And this is apparently a message that could be distributed more effectively and hasn't been. Again, a mentoring problem probably could explain some of that. And then there's this interesting and puzzling issue about the choice of research topic. This is fairly recently coming to light. Many individuals uh, from diverse backgrounds, underrepresented groups, and particularly African Americans, are often given the advice, you should work in an area that's relevant uh, to your population. So there's a lot of mentoring about working in areas of health disparities. It turns out that grants for health disparities and for social behavioral research, another area that many African Americans are steered toward, uh, actually across NIH, regardless of the nature of the applicant, as a group do not fund a fair quite as well as things that are, for instance, molecular genetics. And yet it seems as if, perhaps with good intentions, African-American applicants are being moved in a direction where already they're in a field that's not going to do as well. And this is another area where I think we really have to work on the mentoring area. I mean, you might ask the question, why don't health disparities applications do as well? Do we have too many applications in that place? Is it, in fact, that the science of health disparities needs an upgrade? Or is it that there's a bias in the peer review system against such applications? We need to figure those things out. But nonetheless, it's pretty clear that this is part of the discrepancy between African-American applicants and those in the majority, that there are more, uh, more of a tendency to focus in areas that traditionally don't do as well. But then the big elephant in the room is, is there actually a bias in peer review? I think I don't know any peer reviewer uh, who could really imagine that that's the case. Our peer reviewers are people of high principle. The idea that they might have some kind of bias against an applicant who's not uh, like themselves is uh, repellent uh, for those folks to contemplate. And yet anybody who has looked at the issue of unconscious bias or even exposed yourself to one of those uh, internet-based tests will discover that none of us are completely free of this. If you haven't tried that out, try it, and you'll discover some things about yourself that you wish were not true. So maybe we have a problem. Now, you might say we shouldn't because there's nothing in the grant application that discloses uh, the ethnicity of the applicant. But of course, it's often apparent from which schools were attended or other aspects of the CV, or maybe just something you know about the person. The only way we're really going to settle this is to conduct an experiment and we're in the midst of doing this now by taking a whole set of applications and pilot an anonymization process where you take off anything that would hint as to who the applicant is or their organization or anything about their background that might be disclosing and you review the grants 
that have been anonymized and the same grants that haven't been anonymized, and you look to see, is there a systematic difference? Uh, this is, I think, the only way we'll get the answer. I think all of us are holding our breath to see what the answer is, but we have to know. So I'm putting this all out there as being fairly disclosing about a very difficult and troubling area. For us at NIH, we are determined to get to the bottom of this and figure out what the answer is and provide a greater opportunity for those applicants to have success. But it is not a simple matter, and there are aspects of this that are certainly troubling. Well, the third thing, and then we'll see if you have any questions, if I've left enough time for that, which I hope I will, is the diversity of the research participants. After all, if research of a medical sort uh, is not just uh, a, an opportunity, but maybe even a benefit if you're involved in an area that might ha actually help you, we want to be sure uh, that we're making that equally available uh, to all those who might be interested. Uh, and we also think if we want to understand medicine and medical interventions, be they for prevention or treatment, we need to come up with answers that will apply to everybody. We don't have a terribly good track record over the decades in that regard, although, as I'll tell you, I think in this instance, we've actually come a long way. But let me try to explain why I say that. Certainly, we don't have a good track record. And it, certainly, if anybody is approaching uh, a population of African Americans about participating in a research study, they need to be prepared uh, to talk about Tuskegee and what happened there, because this was a disgraceful circumstance where individuals were involved in research without an explanation of what was going on, and were in fact, because of their participation in research, uh, uh, in a situation where they did not get to have the standard treatment uh, for their particular illness, which was syphilis. Uh, this is, in every way, uh, an unethical experience that should never have happened. This was exposed in 1972, um, and in 1997, uh, Bill Clinton offered a former apology on behalf of the nation. But that memory sticks, and it should, as a reminder of how researchers, who probably somehow thought they were carrying out ethical research, uh, so completely missed the point of what it means uh, to give consent and to treat your subjects with appropriate consideration of benevolence and non-maleficence and paying attention to equity and justice and autonomy. Interestingly, recently I've been very engaged uh, in a circumstance that many people thought might have echoes of Tuskegee, and this was the whole story of HeLa cells, the most commonly used cells that people study to understand human biology, and which were derived uh, from Henrietta Lacks, a woman in 1951 in Baltimore who presented with cervical cancer, uh, had a biopsy taken which for the first time produced cells that would grow in the laboratory after many failures uh, prior to that. Uh, Henrietta Lacks died eight months later uh, of a wide, uh, invasive cervical cancer. And this fact that this uh, cell culture had been obtained was something she never knew about. These were named uh, Gila, uh, but many people thought that stood for Helen Lane. That was even a story that was spread about rather wildly widely, uh, so certainly this was not something that in any way uh, recognized her contribution. In 1971, her identity was made public uh, in a particular piece, but subsequent works, uh, and particularly Rebecca Skloot's book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, which has now been turned to an HBO movie uh, starring Oprah Winfrey that I suspect many of you saw, meant that Henrietta's children and grandchildren now also became public figures, whether they liked it or not. The whole genome sequence of HeLa was completed uh, four years ago, and a German group that obtained it put it online. The Lacks family found out about this, and they were offended uh, that not only had all this happened uh, with Henrietta's cells and they had never been informed about it, but now information that might have relevance to them as first and second degree relatives was also being placed in the public domain without consulting them. And this seemed like a very significant moment for the research community uh, to stop and take stock about what are we doing here and what do we, in fact, owe as an ethical responsibility to these family members. They are no longer anonymous. They're very much known. So I, with a couple of my staff, uh, organized meetings, uh, and this was much helped by Hopkins, uh, with family members. We had three meetings, uh, long meetings uh, in a 
uh, a room with the family members uh, surrounded by um, uh, lots of concerns and important issues. But over the course of those three meetings, understanding their perspective, uh, we agreed that this is something where they ought to have some say in who had access to this data. It emerged, however, that they were not opposed to research. They were actually proud that HeLa cells had been involved in so many discoveries. So many Nobel Prizes can trace their discoveries to the use of HeLa cells. They wanted that to go on. They wanted, as one of them said, for Henrietta's cells to keep on working. But they wanted to be respected in terms of what, even though it might be small, a risk might apply to them about the DNA sequence in those cells. And so we came up with a solution which basically means anybody who wants access to the full DNA sequence has to apply and explain what they're going to do. And we have a working group, which includes two of the LAX family members who reviews every one of those applications and decides about whether it fits with their idea of what this uh, ought to be used for under a very specific criteria. And this has worked extremely well. And the LAX family members have become real heroes, have been out speaking on this, and I must say have become good friends uh, for me and my colleagues, just as wonderful people who are really trying to step forward here and say, how can we do this right? They knew about Tuskegee too. They didn't want that to happen again. This is a very different example. Another place we might point to, Framingham, starting 1948, the granddaddy of all the cohort studies and the one that taught us so much about cardiovascular disease. And they were ahead of themselves because at that time, almost all studies were including men. And Framingham included women as well. But most other studies did not. And so we needed to do something in that regard. And I guess uh, it would be worth mentioning a few leaders in that space, members of Congress, people like Senator Mikulski, but at NIH, people like Ruth Kirstein, and yes, the person who hired me at NIH, who was mentioned earlier, Bernadine Healy. And out of this came the Women's Health Initiative, a 15-year study that addressed common causes of death, disability, impaired quality of life, and postmenopausal women. And the, the results from this continue uh, to come in. Uh, I recently saw an economic analysis that said the money spent on the Women's Health Initiative has returned 141 to 1 in terms of its health economic savings because of what we've learned from this. This really got the idea that women need to be deeply engaged in research uh, in everybody's mind. And over the course of the last 20 years, uh, now 25 years, now we've made a lot of progress in that space. The Office of Research on Women's Health was established in 1990. Uh, originally, the director, uh, Vivian Penn, uh, now the director, uh, Janine Clayton. Uh, having mentioned Vivian Penn, I can't help but show you this picture, uh, because very recently... <laughs> yeah, very recently you stole her from us. <laughs> for this uh, pinhall dedication. Now, Vivian's uh, one of the people I most admire, and of course, she was the first African-American woman graduate of the University of Virginia Medical School and has deep ties here. And here you can see at the dedication of pinhall uh, very recently, uh, along with Dean Wilkes and Dr. Sutton Wallace and Dr. Shannon, um, and having this hall named for her. And interestingly, I couldn't help but notice the former name of this hall, Jordan Hall. Who was Jordan? He was an American eugenicist. So this is a wonderful way uh, to move us from where we were. And let's remember that eugenics was not the sole property of Nazi Germany. The roots of eugenics were sown here in the United States in the early 20th century. Other things that we've ha seen happen, we have an Office of Minority Programs that was established that same year, 1990. It is now an institute, one of our 27 institutes. Eliseo Perestable is the new director and has just funded seven research centers in, in minority institutions and centers of excellence. This is a vibrant part of who we are at NIH. We have just established a couple years ago a tribal health research office focusing on American Indians and Alaska Natives uh, with David Wilson as the director, and also a sexual and gender minority research office established also in 2015 uh, with Karen Parker as its lead. So, we are gradually, and maybe we should have done it sooner, but we're doing it now, uh, focusing on these areas of particularly important minority health and health disparities and trying to make sure that the resources that we have the opportunity uh, to put forward are being used wisely in all these ways. Now, what about participants in research um, that we are doing today? 
Again, we've come a long way, and I think you could even look at this and say we're probably there, but I'm showing the overall totals, and I'm still concerned that there are specific projects that may not be as well uh, diverse as they could be. Uh, you can see overall 63% of participants are white, uh, but you can look at the other proportionalities, 10.6% uh, black, uh, and, um, and so on down the list. Uh, we have, as far as females and males, in our overall uh, trials that involve uh, human subjects, uh, slightly over half are, are females. But again, we've got to look individually. So we now have the opportunity, and it's coming on quite quickly, for the public to see, and every one of the institutes and every one of the programs, what does this diversity look like? We want to be held accountable. But let me finish by telling you about a particular project where we aim to take this to an even higher level. And that is this effort in precision medicine, because we have a historic opportunity to try to understand how we are all the same, but also how we are all different, and how when it comes to medical prevention or treatment, knowing about the kinds of things that are specific to the individual is going to be a wonderful way to improve outcomes. Uh, we've kind of done one-size-fits-all medicine for much of our patient care, and it's the best we can do in many situations, but why should we be satisfied with that? You wouldn't be if you went uh, to get a new pair of glasses. You expect to have something that's right for you. Same for your shoes. What about your medicine? Does it make sense that that should also take account of individual differences? Of course it does. The problem is we haven't really had the data to be able to see how to do that because it takes very large studies and lots of data. And what I want to tell you about is a program that is going to change all of that by bringing together a diverse group of researchers, caregivers, and participants uh, to carry out the largest study of health and disease in the most diverse group of participants that has ever happened in the United States. It's going to involve patient partnerships, and patients are incredibly interested these days in taking part in research, and we want to empower them. Our partners are going to be our partners. They're not necessarily going to be patients. Many of these people will be healthy. Uh, we, we want to respect them in that regard. Uh, we have the ability, even though EHRs, electronic health records, are clunky, they're available for many people, and they do provide research opportunities we didn't have before. We have lots of technologies we can use to try to monitor what's happening to people. Uh, I've got a Fitbit and an Apple Watch on, and I don't know what you're wearing tonight, but <laughs> those kinds of things could be great research tools. And we have genomics and the ability to learn a lot about what's happening with your DNA and your RNA and some proteomics and metabolomics, throw that in there too. All of this makes for big data, which by the way we're going to talk about tomorrow morning in a different session with Phil Bourne, if any of you are interested in that. You put this all together and we are at a unique time uh, to try to understand health and disease. So we had a unique opportunity uh, to begin to make a pitch about a program uh, that would otherwise uh, be uh, fairly difficult to mount and brought this idea uh, in front of the President of the United States at that time, Barack Obama. You can see an interesting collection of folks here uh, gathered in the Oval Office talking about this very issue. Is it time to mount an effort to try to study health and disease? And um, over the course of that uh, time, involving also many members of Congress, the conclusion was, yes, this is a moment that has, whose time has come. And out of this has come the All of Us program which aims to try to accelerate health research and medical breakthroughs, but for all of us, meaning this has to be a very diverse effort. That means that we have to focus on treating our partners as partners, building data sets that researchers can get access to without a whole lot of obstacles as long as they're qualified and as long as the data has been secure and anonymized, and having an ecosystem of researchers and funders to make this all work. This means a rich longitudinal research resource. We aim to enroll one million Americans, one million, over the course of the next two or three years, uh, and to include within the data sets that are built uh, with their permission, electronic health records, laboratory uh, test results, um, results of wearable sensors, and genomic data. If you want to join, you have to wait till next spring, but you don't have to wait very long. Uh, you can either come as a direct volunteer, or if your health provider organization is participating, you can actually enroll that way. And we are already starting this into a beta test, and a lot of what we're doing right now is trying to make sure we're setting this up so that diverse participants can actually trust that their data is going to be treated appropriately. And we recognize all the things that have happened in the past. 
But our goal here is to end up, by the way, these are scenes uh, from our traveling all of us uh, educational program, which is going to be uh, moving around the country uh, in the course of the next few months. The inaugural partners are extensive here across the country. All of these are, in fact, funded parts of this enterprise. And we aim to have more than 50% of the participants in all of us as being traditionally underrepresented groups. Not 10 or 20%, more than 50%. And that means working with the community health centers, uh, working with a wide variety of other groups to try to reach out and make that opportunity available to those who might otherwise not be touched uh, by that opportunity. The beta phase got started a couple months ago. We've now enrolled 3,400 people as we're going through the protocol, figuring out where the kinks are. It's looking pretty good, but we want to optimize and tune everything. Uh, we'll be ramping up the beta phase over the course of the next few months to more than 100 locations. Uh, and the national phase will launch in the spring, probably in April. And at that point, there will be a big blast uh, of announcements about this, and we hope all of you will sign up because uh, I don't think you want to miss the chance uh, to be part of this national adventure. And furthermore, we want this not just to be an American adventure, but it ought to also be an opportunity for global collaboration. Because it turns out the U.S. is not the only country that's thought about this. Uh, other countries are doing something similar, although perhaps not quite as extensive as ours. And if we can figure out how to share data in a way that protects privacy and confidentiality, we could learn a lot by the, the synthesis of what these cohorts can teach us. So coming back to where I started in my last slide, one of the people that I most admire uh, in the whole world and who I've had the privilege of getting to know and to share uh, stories and prayers and even an occasional joke is Archbishop Desmond Tutu, just a remarkable man, a remarkable leader. And yes, he's had his genome sequenced. He wanted to be sort of out there, uh, making it clear that this is something that we should not be afraid of, but something we should celebrate. And he says, my dream is that by including all peoples in understanding and reading the genetic code, we will realize that all of us belong in one global family, that we are all brothers and sisters. And he says, wow, as only he can say it. <laughs> and so my message again to you is, when we look at diversity, at the critical importance of focus on this topic, and my hat again is off uh, to Dr. Fitzgerald uh, for making it possible to have presentations like this uh, with audiences like those of you who are here. Uh, we have a lot that we can point to scientifically uh, that undergirds the important principles of how we should treat each other as equals. Uh, and yet, we have a lot of social pressures that are inevitable in any society and seem to be particularly tense in some places right now. And it behooves us in our headlong rush uh, to learn about things, to expand our knowledge, uh, to take some time uh, to focus on this issue as we are doing here this evening. And so I thank you for the privilege of being able to be part of that. And thank you for being here and happy to take any questions you might have. So I know that the hour is a bit late, but if there's one or two questions and somebody has a microphone, I'm told uh, that could be, and I'm seeing a hand right here. And after the Q&A, there might be a little final surprise. Okay. Curious, um, how has your work been influenced by growing up in Stanton in the 50s and 60s? Well, that's a great question. Um, I grew up, uh, went, uh, my mother taught me at home until the sixth grade because uh, she thought she was a better teacher uh, than the county schools, and I think she might have been right, although I don't mean to put down the county schools. Uh, but then we moved in town, and I went to public schools uh, in Stanton, which were at that time, I think, very uh, high quality. My first interest in science was because of that. But I went to a segregated high school. 
that only became integrated during the time I was there. And the palpable tension that was there it was certainly something I noticed, but had trouble understanding, because from perspective of everything I knew, uh, we were all the same. That was not something that I had somehow gotten on a different path, maybe because of my parents who had very broad views uh, about equality. When Martin Luther King was assassinated, um, I was a student here and went back to Stanton that weekend uh, for a march down the main street in support of all of the African American communities who were so desperately grieving at this circumstance. We marched down the street and we marched all the way uh, to the African American church and we all went in and took part. And that was a very special day, walking with my parents and my brothers, but also a very frightening day as I watched the sneers on the faces of people in my own town who stood on the side who clearly thought this was the wrong thing to do. Never was it more apparent to me uh, that we had great divisions than on a day that was supposed to be a day of coming together. So I keep that memory with me. Uh, certainly my own experience uh, since then, largely in science, has been this very clear sense that the things that I've had the most fun with and have been the most productive are those circumstances where we have people with wildly different backgrounds and experiences all coming together. So it's never really seemed like anything other than obvious. But obviously, we have as a research community not done a great job of recognizing, of making that a priority, and of doing something about it. Other questions? Back here. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Um, months ago, uh, I appreciate you bringing up the Henrietta Lack story because it seems that we're destined to repeat that process again. Uh, months ago, I had a procedure done at a major medical center in the area, which will remain nameless. And reading the consent form carefully at the bottom, it said that any tissue gain could be used for the advancement of medical science. And it seems like that's a way of getting around the Henrietta Lacks problem. Mm. And I mm. wondered if you would comment on that. Well, that's a great question. And we've had a very intense debate over the last five or six years about whether it is ethical uh, to use human tissue specimens for research without explicit consent, where somebody says, yes, I agree, and they have an opportunity to say, no, I don't agree. Uh, my own view was that we ought to move in that direction. But there are strong opinions uh, from people in the research community that that might actually produce a real dearth uh, of opportunity to make discoveries. And some would argue, how are you harmed uh, if your tissue is anonymized, so nobody knows it's from you, and then it's used for research that might lead to a benefit to you or somebody else. So this, uh, this has kind of been an ongoing discussion. Uh, there is a new view uh, of the common rule, uh, which is the way in which oversight of human subjects research is carried out, uh, which suggests that we should consider this every couple of years, but the time being we won't change the perspective and that it will continue to be okay to use anonymized uh, tissue samples uh, from individuals without their explicit consent. I think what you're raising is the question about is that really the right thing? And you can talk to a hundred people and get very different answers. Lots of people who are involved in disease research as patients uh, are in fact incensed uh, in the other direction that tissue might not be available for research. I mean, like they would argue, why would the person care if it's been removed and they have no use for it and their identity has been stripped off of it. So it's an interesting and ongoing debate. I'm glad you brought it up. It's not been resolved. Maybe one more question and then I'm going to feel sorry for the rest of you. Yes. Hi. Um, first of all, I want to thank you and other researchers for uh, research uh, in the Human Genome Project for disorders like neurofibromatosis type 1. But I wanted to ask you another question. Um, about diversity in people who work in medical fields and research fields who have disabilities of various types and how do we work to increase that diversity? Uh, I rarely see doctors who have significant physical disabilities that are even 
close to the same league as my own disabilities, let alone even more significant disabilities that can be sympathetic for people and can help people connect more and can also help, under, help researchers understand what people actually go through on a day-to-day -day basis? I think that's a great question. I suspect here at the University of Virginia there are people thinking about how we can make uh, the medical profession, the nursing profession, the genetic counseling profession, uh, something that is welcoming uh, to people with disabilities that will still enable them to do a terrific job, but maybe even add extra uh, to their ability to be seen uh, by their patients as people who've also gone through something similar. Uh, certainly at NIH, we have a strong effort to try to recruit as researchers and in our clinical center as caregivers, uh, people with disabilities. Uh, I think we do reasonably well, but we could do better in that regard. I'm glad you brought it up. As long as we're talking about diversity, that's a really important issue. Thank you. Well, just because there was some suggestion that maybe music was appropriate at this event, and uh, we had the really good music at the beginning, now we're going to have the, oh, well, we'll get through it music at the end. So. <laughs> This is a group event. <laughs> and you'll enjoy it, I promise. Uh, there's nothing like, after a sort of occasion like this, a lot of emotions, maybe a lot of concepts, um, a lot of opportunity for the various parts of your brain to connect. There was this mention about music in the brain a little bit ago. Uh, that's something that I'm working on. This is a way that we can draw together, and music is an awfully good way to do that. And it maybe uh, we'll be asking a little bit of you to learn a chorus that you don't already know, but it's really simple. And this is a song I did not write. I wish I could take credit for it, but I can't. It's by a folk, song or folk singer named Carrie Newcomer. And it just seemed to me it was particularly appropriate for what we're talking about this evening. It may be particularly appropriate for singing this in Charlottesville, Virginia, because it's about struggles that they don't necessarily yield up easy answers, but we got to keep at it. And if anybody says, well, it's just not the time. Have you heard people say that? Well, it's just not the time to worry about that. The answer you, I would generally give if it's something like diversity or it's something like racism or bigotry, if not now, tell me when. That's what this song is about. And the chorus goes like this. If not now, tell me when. If not now, tell me when. We may never see this moment or place in time again. If not now, if not now, tell me when. You can sing that, right? Let's try. All you got to know is if not now, tell me when. And if you don't quite get the third line, it's OK. You'll get it the third time. If not now, tell me when. If not now, tell me when. We may never see this moment or place in time again. If not now, if not now, tell me when. Okay, the verse. I see sorrow and trouble in this land. I see sorrow and trouble in this land. Although there will be struggle, we must make the change we can. If not now, if not now, tell me when. Chorus. If not now, tell me when. If not now, tell me when. We may never see this moment place in time again if not now if not now tell me when I may never see the promised land I may never see the promised land and yet 
yet we'll make the journey. We'll walk it hand in hand. If not now, if not now, tell me when. A little harmony here. If not now, tell me when. If not now, tell me when. We may never see this moment or place in time again. If not now, if not So we'll work until it's done Every daughter, every son Every soul that ever longed for something better Something brighter All together now There's nothing we can't do All together now There's nothing we can't do Though sometimes we grow weary Sharing dreams will see us through If not now, if not now Tell me when If not now Tell me when If not now Tell me when We may never see this moment Or place in time again If not now, if not now Tell me when One more time Dr. Collins, thank you so very much for a wonderful presentation and a moving evening. To uh, Dr. Shannon, thank you. Our friends from the uh, UVA Medical School and uh, the hospital, the entire health uh, system, all of you, thank you. To Candace Potts, thank you. We hope you will join us for the next event in this series with uh, Shankar Vedantam, host of NPR's The Hidden Brain, on Thursday, October 26th. Thank you, and good evening.